are nearly 3,000 unsolved murder cases in Washington. The Unsolved Northwest team is working to bring them back into the spotlight with hopes of finding justice. Here's a collection of the recent missing persons and murder cases that Unsolved Northwest has featured. When somebody taking your sister away from you, you don't heal. It's, it's, you never heal. I mean, it's like living in hell. We're still thinking about her and that we're hoping someone out there know what's happened. I mean, someone does, um, and maybe can help us find her, bring her home for my mom. I feel hurt. Today, it's just anniversary ceremony. What the monk is doing is just chanting her name, and that wherever she's at, they hope that she's at peace. I'm just gonna put this around your collar, if that's all right. All right, and we're good to go. Yeah, I responded to their apartment. I, mean, I have a vague recollection of it, just that I was called there on a call and talked to the family, got the information. This was just one of the flyers that was sent out by our police department at the time when we were searching for Wiki and investigating the case. She had left home in the Linwood area and uh, gone to Shoreline Community College where she was dropped off there reportedly by her current boyfriend at that time. And then from there was gonna be going down to downtown Seattle. She worked at the federal building. She did not show up to work. After she went missing, we realized that they've been dating for two years. He was married. She was 17 when they met and he was 27. She wanted him to leave his wife and he keep promising her he would. Did the boyfriend have an alibi? Uh, he had an alibi that he was at work. It's not proved or disproved whether he was or wasn't there. Wiki's boyfriend did give a statement to police. In it, he describes how Wiki claimed she had been raped by multiple men. He even had the names of those alleged rapists, but police could never find any evidence to support his stories. Police also tell us that after giving that statement, the boyfriend failed the polygraph test. It was a convoluted story of victimization. Our detectives made a number of efforts to corroborate any of those storylines and those people, and they found nothing. So I think those storylines were disproven. Asian culture, we don't really have therapy. We don't talk openly. We try to hide everything because what people think of us is very important. Do you have any plans, as best you know, to re-interview the boyfriend? Not currently, no. The case is not being actively investigated. It's not closed. It's still an open case for us. This is an age-progressed photo that uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children did on Wiki, what she would be presumed or estimated to look at, look like today. We do not want people to forget about her. She still have a family that love her very much, that wants her home. Every time we do this, it's like she's alive again to us. I don't give up hope and I'll keep going even after my mother's gone and after I'm gone, my daughter will keep going. It's a feeling I get when it's foggy out. It instantly reminds me. Two other relatives, brother and sister Jeff and Harmony Spencer are recovering from bullet wounds. The motive, unknown. Uh -uh. 
it's surreal. I mean, there's moments when I can see it all so clearly, like it just happened because it just, it stays in your mind. It stays in your heart. There was a lot of people in that room. There was probably at least 20 people in the basement, probably all feeling the same way as I was, just scared. It didn't seem real, but it was at the same time the most real thing I've ever been through. She was very sweet and down to earth, funny, and had this infectious laugh that she was willing to try just about anything. It's a memory that I always, always have with me. We know that Jeff Spencer was dating Kimberly. Kimberly was a student at the University of Washington. Her family's from Hawaii, so she didn't have any family in the Northwest. She was shot and killed and died in his arms. This was a big story at the time, 20 years ago, uh, and King Five covered it extensively. Uh, not only did we cover it, but we spoke to Jeff Spencer 20 years ago uh, on King, talking about the moment that his girlfriend died. I'd always wanted to tell her that I loved her before, and then I never did and then until that night. I could still remember just looking at her face and holding her, and then she was and, but she was dying, so I just held her and I told, told her, her I love you. you. Dozens of volunteers and police are canvassing Tacoma neighborhoods with flyers, offering a $26,000 reward for information. It would just be wonderful to find the person responsible for this and get some closure for the families. 20 years later, Tacoma Police Detective Julie Dyer is on the case. She's a mother herself, and it becomes very clear that she's not immune to the emotions that the death of a child evokes. It's heartbreaking. Um, I just, as somebody that's completely innocent, has no involvement in anything, and, um, and you can't do anything about it. This grandfather's heart is ripped apart as he looks at the smiling face of Jeremy Bayanthavong. <laughs> Sweet kid, five years old. Just had his birthday. Now he's dead. There's nothing we can do. Well, detectives seem clearly uh, upset and connected with this case. Do they have any leads? So early on, investigators came out and they said that they believed this was gang related, possibly targeted. Obviously, the boy that was killed was an innocent victim. They believe that the young woman was also an innocent victim in this. The Spencer family maintains all these years later that this was totally random, and they say they can't imagine who would do this to their family. Never in my wildest dreams would I have ever imagined the scene that was downstairs going on that upstairs we were oblivious to other than the noise. Justice has been slow for Kimberly and Jeremy as police continue to search for a suspect. A 70s or 80s Ford dark colored pickup with a white canopy. But authorities have little else to go on, nor are they speculating if this crime is connected to a different drive-by shooting at this same home two years ago. It's uh, maddening to know that there's people in Tacoma that know they're probably within five, ten miles of us right now that know. The first couple of years, there was so many things I wish I could have changed. If I would have done this, then maybe people wouldn't have died, or if I would have done something else that day. In the 20 years since the shooting, Spencer has become a father. He has two teenage girls. He's, in a way, moved on with his life but he makes it clear it really doesn't take much to bring him back to that night. The guilt that you feel from losing people that you love, that's um, tough. Happy birthday, dear Cricket. Happy birthday to you and many more.
What did you love most about her? Gee, uh, <laughs> she had a nice laugh. It would make me smile just to hear her laugh. <laughs> she was a strong individual. You're never touching me again. So these are our wedding photos. I like that photo of us. I think it kind of captures the emotion. Okay. I'm Dwight Guy. Greg Guy was my wife. We were married over 30 years when she was killed. When it was stormy, she liked going out and watching the wave action. She was out to walk Alki, and the last communication I actually have from her is a text saying, you know, the waves aren't doing much, nothing was happening, and she was going to start heading home. So on the way home, she went and she stopped at the viewpoint. About nine o'clock that night, I started thinking, well, she should have been home by now. Started, you know, wondering where she was, what was going on. Dwight drove to where he thought she might be, but he didn't drive south enough on Beach Drive. And if he did, he would have seen her car parked right here. I called 911 and, and made a missing persons report. And I happened actually to open up my uh, computer and I was looking and there was a report and it might have been King 5. For the people who live here along Beach Drive in West Seattle, it has left them a little unnerved. People on the ferry seen a body, and I'm like, oh crap, I bet that's her. Something happened. Two detectives showed up at my door, where I saw the guy in the suits, and I opened the door. They confirmed that it was her. The way they said it, it was random. Came up behind her, slit her throat. No reason for it, no cause just opportunity. It's like, why would someone do that? I mean, there was a little disbelief, but a lot of anger. Um, sadness, of course, she's gone. It's been nearly 11 years since Gregette Guy was killed. And shortly after her murder, a vigil was held in the community. Oh. The Seattle police tell me every year since they've investigated this. What happened here in 2012? Around 8 p.m. or a little bit later, she was attacked. The next morning, her body is recovered about a quarter mile to the north. As of right now, we have no eyewitness to exactly what happened when Greg Guy was attacked. It's just a lot of questions that we need to answer. And just a random attack on a random woman at a random park in West Seattle. It's very disturbing. Yeah. At this point in time, I don't know that it'll ever be solved. While Dwight has his doubts after it's been so many years since Greg was killed, Detective Norton tells me this is a solvable case. I don't like the term cold case. Actually, it's a, it, it's a point because I think it puts a value judgment on an investigation or maybe suggests a lack of activity. And, and that's certainly not the case in many older investigations. It's true, many of these are old, they've gone unsolved for years, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been activity. She was torn from our lives. We were together so long, was, she was a part of me. I mean, it feels like a part is missing. <laughs> Little things like just not hearing her laugh, not seeing her smile. I mean, it's all gone. There's, there's nothing there. Uh, so, there's just a void. At Camp River Ranch in King County, Gregette Guy is remembered. She was heavily involved in the Girl Scouts, a brownie herself, and also a volunteer. And after her funeral, funds were collected to then help the installation of a totem pole and plaque to remember her. If you know anything about this case, call Seattle Police. The cemetery's in Marysville. I mean, she's right along the pathway. So I just park the car on the pathway and I take a few steps and you know, there are stones right there. It, it's still a tragedy, 30, year, 30 plus years later. So the biggest question now is, who actually saw her last? My name is Robert Dawson. Um, I'm the brother, the oldest brother of Catherine. She was my little sister. Tell me about Kathy. She was the baby that, you know, kind of looked after. 
She was a great person. She was always very happy. My name is Lynn McKee, and I am the mother of Catherine Lynn Dawson. She loved horses, dogs. Um, she showed dogs. She got along with everybody. She was a street kid um, and trusted everybody. Family members say Kathy was involved in drugs. She struggled with addiction and she hung out with known drug dealers. In fact, the last time Bob spoke to her, she was in jail on drug-related charges. Sometime after she got uh, out of jail, she says, I plan on coming over and seeing Eva on the 27th of June when I'm, you know, I'll be out by then. You know, we never heard from her. She would phone me constantly during the week, said, you know, Eva's birthday was coming up. I'm Eva Dawson. And she wanted to have a birthday party. My mother is Kathy Dawson. When she didn't phone back, I knew something was wrong. Um, she just never showed up. It's been sad and just, it hurts my heart. <laughs> Investigators are involved in this tedious, hands-on search in this illegal garbage dump. They say it's too early to tell. If and we heard this story being released on the news. I knew in my heart that it was her. The skeleton found in this garbage dump is all that's left of this woman, 24-year-old Katherine Dobson. Her killer left her body here sometime between June 20th and July 17th. We come in here and they throw car parts, furniture parts, and general trash. And it's difficult for the detectives to find uh, well, what's evidence and what's non-evidence because of that. It drove me crazy that they labeled her. This club, the Deja Vu in Everett, is where the victim worked as a topless dancer until her disappearance in June. Dancer from Deja Vu. They never said that she was a mother, a daughter. Investigators still aren't sure if her work here has anything to do with her death. It wasn't right. She was a human being. Almost a year later, December 1992, finally a break in the case. Informants tell prosecutors that Kathy's murder was a hit job ordered by Yakima-based drug traffickers who thought Kathy was a snitch. The enforcement end of, the, of that organization uh, picked her up from jail and then she was gone, taken from us. let them go? Yes. Because I, in my gut, I thought they had something to do with it. Do you still believe that? Yep. Of course, DNA wasn't there at the time, but we have DNA now. Why, why can't it, they get solved? somebody to pay for their crime. Fess up. Give us some clues. I just, I just wish I got to know my mom. Heartbreaking when I look at Eva because I see my sister. I randomly go up to Marysville and see my mother's gravesite. It gives me a little peace, you know. I talk to her. Well, I talk to her about her kids. I give her updates on her kids. Yeah, sometimes I'll catch myself just like talking to her. I don't really know what I'm talking to, but. She was just a wonderful sister, a wonderful mother. Yeah, that's how she should be remembered. It's not fair. It's just not fair. Family members say 14-year-old Tanya Frazier was shy and quiet almost one week after she mysteriously disappeared. I guess take your time. Yeah, we'll get through it. Okay. 
My name is Tara Frazier, and Tanya is my sister. And my soulmate. Sorry. No, no. just waiting for her and I was like she's got to come home like I, I slept with my window open all night because I'm like she's just out even though she had never ever like snuck out or you know not come home I couldn't fathom that anything had happened to her she turned up dead on Saturday in this field near the Arboretum found by a man walking his dog well, everybody's just devastated I mean totally devastated It was like the most numbing feeling. And then a lot of the rest is a blur after that. It still hurts just as much. I can like function, but the moment anybody says anything, about her or I see somebody that we went to middle school with it makes me cry and I love talking about her um, but it makes me cry every single time it, it hurts now that you know I'm older I go up and just sit you know at the cemetery and talk to her and cry sometimes laugh it makes me feel a little bit closer to her I can't imagine this just never being solved and us never having that closure. The week that Tanya went missing, the family was contacted by a private investigator named Rose Winquist, and she's been on the case ever since. I have a couple banker boxes full of stuff. I've followed up on different leads. We met with them in August. Essentially, what they told Teresa and Tira was that you'll hear from us when we make an arrest. Years and years later, when it's still the same thing, it, it doesn't reassure me. Why can't you talk to me? Like, I'm family. But I felt like since I was a kid, they've said the same thing to me. I started working on this case in June of 2016. There's a lot of persons of interest, and until we reach a conclusion in this case, no one's gonna give a pass. Tanya Frazier was last seen by friends and students at the intersection of 21 and East Thomas that morning about 11 a.m. Several of her classmates and friends described her talking to an unknown individual. Was that person involved? Maybe. I am hopeful. I, I can't imagine this just never being solved and us never having that closure. This is one of our last pictures, but I love seeing her face. Everybody who knew her loved her. Like she was just such an amazing soul and human being and she made my life better and so many other people's life better and joyous. The Unsolved Northwest team is speaking with victims, families, and detectives. We are also digging through archives in hopes of spotlighting these cases, but we need your help. Missing persons cases, murders, and other mysteries are solvable, and you might have the piece of information that leads to answers. Visit kingvibe.com unsolved to read more. While you're there, you can also suggest a case we should look into, or you can leave us a tip. Stay tuned for a new Unsolved Northwest special in May.